This is a short overview of anorectal disorders. We're going to be talking about fecal incontinence, hemorrhoids, perianal abscess, anal fistula, anal fissures, pilonodal cyst, rectal prolapse, and anal cancer. First, here's a quick picture of the anus and the rectum. This is the most distal part of the GI tract and the anatomic location of all these disorders. So let's get started. First, fecal incontinence. This is defined as recurrent uncontrolled passage of fecal material, uh, usually at least 10 milliliters for at least one month in people at least three years old. You can diagnose this with just a clinical history um, exam maybe. You can also consider a flexible sigmoidoscopy or anoscopy. And the definitive test here is manometry to measure the pressures um, in the anorectal region to measure how much the sphincters are working. The treatment here can range from a wide variety of things. First, there are medical treatments. This is essentially bulking agents and fiber to help add bulk to your stools, um, prevent leaking. You can do biofeedback. This is muscle strengthening and control exercises such as kegels. There are injections that you can do to help with the uh, anal sphincters to help tighten them, prevent incontinence, and uh, last case, you could do surgery. Next is hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are defined as a dilation of the submucosal layer uh, within the anorectum. This is usually a purple or blue bulge seen on exam. These are the veins um, going down into the anorectal region. There are internal hemorrhoids as shown here and external hemorrhoids, and they are kind of divided by this pectinate line. So anything that is proximal to the pectinate line is an internal hemorrhoid. Anything that originates distally is an external hemorrhoid. A couple of risk factors that are worth knowing, constipation, old age, uh, prolonged straining and sitting, um, essentially anything that causes increased venous hypertension down there, like prolonged sitting and straining. Symptoms, you might have bleeding. There's this bright red blood per rectum that usually signifies an internal hemorrhoid. Itching, burning and pain usually uh, signifies an external hemorrhoid, and a large fraction of them, about 40%, are actually asymptomatic. So if you see bleeding, think internal. If you see uh, pain and a burning sensation, think external, but also know that many can be asymptomatic. The diagnosis is usually made clinically with history and exam. The best test here is endoscopy, actually, uh, getting your eye down there and taking a look at it and seeing what's going on. Many treatments for this as well. Again, wide modalities. First, dietary changes. You want to make sure your patient is hydrated, has a lot of fiber, maybe taking stool softeners to help them reduce their constipation. Fat and alcohol can also constipate you, so reducing those in the diet might also help with constipation, which would then subsequently help with hemorrhoids. Regular exercise can also help with bowel movements. They can do these sits baths to help with the pain. Topical steroids and anesthetics might work as well. If that doesn't work, you can progress to an internal hemorrhoid ligation, and if that doesn't work, you can actually go to surgery. It's called a hemorrhoidectomy. So. Next is the perianal abscess. The pathophysiology here is occlusion of an anal crypt gland that then uh, promotes bacterial overgrowth. It's not able to drain that bacteria out because the, the gland itself is occluded, and you have a formation of an abscess or a collection of pus, bacteria, white blood cells near the anus. So here are several examples of perianal abscesses. This, uh, they're, they're named different things according to their location. Um, some of them might be painful, some of them might be less painful. Um, sometimes they can bleed, sometimes they can have discharge. Um, many different regions for perianal abscesses. The risk factors here are Crohn's disease, um, irritable bowel disease, uh, diabetes and steroids can also predispose you to a perianal abscess. Symptoms, you'll have discomfort when wiping. This can also progress to severe pain and if the abscess infection spreads to the rest of the body, you might have systemic signs like fever. On exam, you might see a red, tender, fluctuant mass on the skin inside or just outside of the anus. The treatment here is incision and drainage. There are systemic antibiotics, and you want to usually give systemic antibiotics to people that are high risk, and that's usually defined by people who have diabetes or people who have systemic signs of their illness, like fever and cellulitis. Um, those people definitely need systemic antibiotics in addition to incision and drainage. Everybody gets incision and drainage if they have a perianal abscess. Next is the anorectal fistula. This is an abnormal communication between the epithelialized surface of the anal canal and the, extra, uh, and the external perianal skin. So these are these tracks that you see here in blue. There are many different kinds of anorectal fistulas. Um, this one, for instance, is called an extra sphincteric. It goes directly from above the pectinate line to outside, to the outside world. Um, these are generally caused by chronic inflammation, 
um, down in the anorectal region. This can be caused by an abscess, like we saw on the previous slide, by IBD, like Crohn's disease, like we mentioned on the previous slide. Cancer, radiation, and infection can also predispose you to anorectal fistulas. The symptoms, you might see some kind of discharge, like on the toilet paper or into the person's underwear. Uh, that discharge can be bloody, it can be serous, it could be pus, it could be fecal matter, and it can be foul smelling. So it could be all kinds of discharge. You can have uh, things growing in there, you can have bleeding in there, you can just have serous discharge, you can kind of be pooping through the fistulas as well. You can also have skin maceration and itching as signs of anorectal fistula. If these fistulas become infected, like the perianal abscess, you'll have pain, swelling, and fever. You'll have more systemic signs uh, if it spreads to the rest of the body. The diagnosis is usually clinical. You can do imaging, you can do a fistulogram to see these things. You can also do MRI and endosonography, but uh, usually you can make the diagnosis clinically. The treatment here is to manage inflammation. If uh, it gets really bad, you're not able to manage it. So managing inflammation can mean several things depending on the origin of these anorectal fistulas. For instance, if somebody has IBD, you might need to give them better uh, immunosuppressants to manage that. If somebody has an infection, they might require antibiotics. If somebody has the perianal abscess, that's antibiotics. Um, if these things keep bothering a person, you can do surgery. It's called a fistulatoma, um, but that doesn't necessarily work all the time. And sometimes you can have recurring anorectal fistulas despite having corrective surgery. Next is the anal fissure. This is a mucosal tear. It can be caused by a tight sphincter and a large caliber stool. So uh, having prolonged constipation can cause this and having prolonged diarrhea can also cause this as well. That The diarrhea can actually be caustic to the anal skin and that can cause an anal fissure. Other things that might cause this are anal sex, uh, IBD, Crohn's disease again, and malignancies. The symptoms and signs you might see here are pain with defecation, again that bright red blood per rectum. You can see a tear on exam usually, that's usually a tear in the anal skin, typically on the posterior midline anus. So starting at the person's anus in the posterior direction toward their back, toward the direction of their butt crack. And sometimes you'll see a skin tag at the distal end of that anal fissure. Treatment here is the sitz bath again helps with pain and discomfort. You can also do topical lidocaine. Nitroglycerin paste can help kind of dilate that anal sphincter to reduce some of the tension there. Botulism can also help relax the sphincter and fiber can help with constipation that might have caused the sphincter uh, to be so tight and the anal fissure to form to begin with. You can also do surgery to release the tension here. That's called a lateral internal sphincterectomy. Next is this pylonidal cyst, or also called pylonidal disease. This is caused by an infective follicle on the lower back. And this is essentially the butt crack, the top of the butt crack that creates a cyst. This uh, usually occurs in people with a hairy back and butt and people who sit for a long time. So it's usually like sedentary, sometimes they're obese. Usually it's like males, this should say males, that are 15 to 30 years old, people with a deep gluteal clefts and a lot of hair. They're sitting down, they kind of compress these hair follicles, they end up getting occluded, they end up with a pylonidal cyst. Symptoms here are pain, usually worse when bending down. You'll actually see this fluctuant mass, four to five centimeters above the anus in the intergluteal region. Again, that's just your butt crack, fancy words for butt cracks. You'll see drainage sometimes, and that drainage can be mucoid, it could be pus, it could be blood. So they essentially have a cyst at the top of their butt crack. Diagnosis is clinical, essentially all of these things I just talked about, your exam, your history, all that. Treatment here is to drain and resect. You can also excise any sinus tracts that might be draining like mucoid fluid or blood, for instance, and that'll take care of the pylonidal cyst. Next is rectal prolapse. The risk here is people being older, uh, 40 years old or older, multiparous women are predisposed to it. They have weakened pelvic floor muscles. Prior pelvic surgeries can predispose you. Constipation, straining, uh, stroke and dementia might also predispose you to people that lose their ability to, to go to the bathroom might end up with a, with a rectal prolapse. There are two big categories, um, or at least two types that are worth knowing. There's the full thickness external rectal prolapse, that's shown in A. Um, this is characterized by circumferential arrangement of folds, that's what you'll see on exam, and that mass will kind of protrude through if they do a Valsalva maneuver. The second type is less severe, it's just mucosal prolapse. You see these radial folds, that's shown in B and um, that'll also protrude, but not quite as far. So the symptoms you'll see here are uh, difficulty straining, um, fecal incontinence, people have like abdominal pain and discomfort. You might see some people do like a digital maneuver to pass stool, so some women 
who uh, have a rectal prolapse might have to pass their stool by pushing their fingers into their vagina and, post and pushing posteriorly to get the stool out. So that, that might be something you hear on, hear on exam for somebody that has weakened pelvic floor muscles and a, and a rectal prolapse. The diagnosis is usually clinical. You'll um, hear a history, stuff like that, that I mentioned, people that strain a lot, people that have fecal incontinence, people that have to use digital maneuvers to pass stool. On exam, you might see one of these, worse with Valsalva maneuver, worse with intra-abdominal pressure. The treatment for this depends on how bad the prolapse is. If it's a small prolapse, like NB, you can usually just recommend fiber, hydration. You can do pelvic floor strengthening as well, like Kegel exercises to help them reduce the amount of prolapse that happens when they, when they strain. For a larger prolapse, like shown in A, you might want to do surgery. That's called a rectopexy. Last slide is anal cancer. This is essentially a cancer that arises in the anus. The most common type is squamous cell carcinoma. And this is a picture of squamous cell carcinoma, carcinoma of the anus. Risk factors here include HPV, smoking, HIV AIDS, and other immunocompromised states, and people who have receptive anal sex. The symptoms here are pain and pressure in the anus. They might have a change in bowel habits. They might have bleeding, itching, and discharge. For high-risk individuals, you can actually do like a pap smear of the anus, an anal pap. Um, in general, you would just want to do a biopsy of this lesion to confirm squamous cell carcinoma. The treatment is this protocol of medications, 5-fluorouracil, mitomycin, and medical radiation. You can also do resection if necessary. So this was a short video on anal rectal disorders. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.